Welcome home. I'm Dr. Tama, a minister, licensed psychologist, and sacred artist. And this is Homecoming, a podcast to facilitate your journey home to yourself. While I will provide weekly inspiration and mental health tips, this podcast is not the same as personalized therapy. I'm so excited you're on the journey. If you want to request specific topics or to submit a poem for me to read on the podcast, email me at homecomingpodcasts at gmail.com. Also, to build our community, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Let's begin. Welcome home, co-journers. I'm glad you're here for another episode, and I'm delighted we have a special guest with us this week. I want to introduce you to Patrice Ford Lynn, who is the CEO and founder of Catapult Change, an executive coaching and consulting firm she founded in 2010. Patrice uses her mindful practices, consulting expertise, and executive coaching skills to elevate other senior black leaders, breaking barriers of race and gender in their respective fields. Patrice is also a certified yogi and breast cancer survivor. Welcome, Patrice. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, you are welcome. I know that that leadership development and leadership support is so important. And so I'm so grateful that you're working in that space And I'll start with what may feel like a simple question, but I think it's significant in terms of our framing. And that is, how do you define leadership or what does it mean to be a leader? Mm. You're right. That that is a big question. And so I will try to distill it down. Okay. For me, leadership means a couple things. One, being able to do the unpopular thing. If you're leading, it apparently means that you're going in a direction others have not been yet, are not willing to go, have doubts about, there's some real question and your ability to walk into a bit of the unknown with courage and tenacity, that's leadership. Yes. To me, the second part of leadership is about accountability. The buck stops with you. So whether the decision is right or wrong, being able to hold accountability for the direction of your team, your organization, that is also leadership. Mm, So important, courage, tenacity, accountability, and vision, because you're talking about going in a new direction. And one of those, when we look at it in psychology is, you know, leadership from the standpoint of maintenance, when you're just continuing to have the organization or the group do what they've been doing. And then you have a specialty around transformational leadership. So tell us about that. When I think about transformational leadership, it really means working with individuals so that they're able to imagine possibilities that have not yet existed in their lives. If what we're doing is just making a little bit better, that's not transformational. If as a result of our work together, you're seeing completely new possibilities for your life, now we're in a transformational space because we have transformed the possibilities for your life. Hmm. I believe that's so important, especially as I think about the mental health journey and the journey home to ourselves is there can be minor tweaks, minor adjustments versus really having a shift in my thinking, a shift in my living. And those things will have a ripple effect because if you have a large internal shift, it's gonna show up in our lives. And as someone who was really drawn to psychology based on my life's journey, I know that for many of us, the work that we end up doing There is a story there. And so I would love if you would share with us your story of what in your life led you to the work you're doing now. That is also a multi-part answer. If you talk to people who knew me 20 plus years ago, it would say, I've always been a coach, that this is not what I do, it's who I am. And I decided to step into it more fully. Now saying that, What that looks like for me was a conversation with my wife. 
while I was a management consultant, where she said to me, you are a phenomenal management consultant, but you're a transformational coach. You're wasting your time. Mm. And she put me on notice that this thing that I was kind of doing part-time, that if I really stepped into it, could be a powerful for me and my clients. And so then I had my own internal reckoning of, did I feel like I was up to that challenge? Was I ready to lead in that arena? I gave myself some tests. I said, okay, can I make this be financially viable? Can I, am I having the transformational outcomes that I want my clients to have? Are we doing great work? And when all of those continue to fall into place, she looked at me again and said, it's time. And I took the leap. Mm, how beautiful, powerful, and necessary to have those people in our lives who see us and see the parts of us that for various reasons we may not either see or acknowledge or move on. And so I'm so glad that she spoke truth and possibility to you. And the second part, that you were willing to receive it. Yes. Because I think there are times in our lives where people can um, name that we need to dream a bigger dream or a different dream. And because of fear, insecurity, intimidation, we don't grab hold of it. And so the fact that you then were able to take the leap is so important. And how many years ago was that? Oh gosh, you know, she told me recently, I'd started the company and was doing it part-time. Mm -hmm. Sounds like maybe four or five years ago was yeah. when I said goodbye to the safety net. Mm. I think that will register with so many of our listeners, no matter what the form of the safety net is, because the safety net can be professional. The safety net can be personal. And there uh, comes a time when we get ready, right? When we are ready and can no longer stay where we are. Now, one of the things you talked about in your definition is doing a new thing, right? If you're a leader, then you have a, a new vision, you're taking us in a new direction. And I know uh, that if you're gonna be a transformational leader, if you're gonna be a change agent, you will meet resistance. And so there are people who don't like change. There are people who wanna protect the status quo and that is a heavy lift. So can you talk about what you do with those who are fighting the transformation? So it depends on their role, right? So often when I work with clients, they come to me because they're stuck. They want to transform or there's a part of them that wants to transform. And there's a part of them that is absolutely frightened, afraid, scared. How do I help folks to calm their nervous systems enough so they can Inhale and exhale into the possibility of doing something while scared. So we often think that when we're ready, we will no longer be scared. I don't believe that to be true. When we are ready, we will be courageous, which means we will be scared and we'll summon the energy to do it scared. Yeah, doing it scared is so important to, for us to mobilize because often we're waiting for everything to line up, right? To have a full court of affirmation, to have the right open doors, to have a large savings account. And we need to, or not a large budget if you're working with an organization. And even with that fear or that anxiety or that uh, insecurity to begin moving forward is so important. And I think when it comes to those voices that are pushing back for us to see it in part, for some of them, it's out of fear. It, what you named oh, uh, fear of the unknown, right? And so if I can see their fear, not just that they're in the way, it will help me to navigate that process and to consider how we bring people along, those who are going to come along. And it also is important that we put it in perspective because sometimes those who are blocking are fewer but louder. And you know, so be, right, being I able to- I love that you noted that because I talked about it from a client perspective. When I think about what it meant, for example, for me to start this business, there are so many people I did not tell because I did not want their negativity. 
Mm. It comes to resistance, part of it is being really honest with yourself about who can ride with you and who can't. Ah. These systems cannot manage yeah. the level of vulnerability that you're stepping into. Mm. And so that's okay. Those folks don't need to be on the ride with you. That's mm -hmm. okay. And accepting that. For me, so much of our, and when I say our, I mean people, our challenges is that we resist the truth of a thing. Mm. I know Betty, Sue, and Paula cannot go on the ride, and I insist on taking them. Mm. That's my suffering. So if I expect, you know what, they can't come. And as much as I would love for them to come, maybe they're family, maybe they're people who have resources I want to be able to leverage for whatever reason, if they can't come, I've got to be able to do it on my own. Mm. And this is so important when we, uh, I use the term homecoming and a part of that is telling yourself the truth and then living from that truth. And one of those painful truths is not everybody is going to catch the vision and not everybody either wants to go or has the capacity to go. And so letting go, That's letting it. go. It's a hard truth. Mm. Many times in my life, I've resisted it yeah. and suffered. <sighs> I'm now feeling bad. I'm weighed down. I'm sad. I'm trying to convince mm. Mm. a lot of work and energy when I'd rather put that energy in towards my intention. Yes. Yeah, so for us to think about how am I creating or prolonging my suffering by feeling I have to convince some people to participate in ways that they are not meant to or not willing to participate. Absolutely. So one of the things I also appreciate about your work is it's not a cookie cutter approach and you are looking at the person who's in front of you and recognizing that identity makes a difference even in leadership. And so I know you have worked in particular with uh, black leaders, with women who are leaders, with queer leaders. And so can you talk some about how identity plays a part in how we're perceived as leaders and how we can be successful? Ooh, again, a big conversation. Thank you for the question. And as I think about each of those identity groups and I think about clients I've worked with in those spaces. So often for black executives, the narrative is we have to work twice as hard. That tends to put us in the mode of survival, which then leads to burnout. So it becomes, I don't want to say a self-fulfilling prophecy, but we're setting ourselves up to fail by playing into that narrative. What I like to do in those moments is bring in a counter narrative and for that one, I might say something like, greatness doesn't require perfection. That you can be great without being perfect, which leaves the room for our humanity. Hmm. Gives people permission to show up as human, not as machines. Oh, I think we need to just pause on that one <laughs> because there is so much pressure to perform, we can treat ourselves like machines. Oh, yeah. And so um, releasing that mindset so that we can show up for ourselves and our humanity. Yeah. It's huge. Mm -hmm. I think about part of the reason that I focus on marginalized populations is it's very easy for somebody with a lot of privilege to say certain things. But if someone who looks like you has similar ways of being in the world as you says them, there's a different credibility they bring. Yes. So if, I'll give you an example. I was talking with a client who during our time together went through tra a transition. Their ability to do that and have a safe space, I can say I'm a safe space. But what it means when I embody that safety because I understand what it's like to not be safe. Mm. And to be clear, I'm not a trans woman, but as a queer woman, I understand when she says, I want to dye my hair, but I'm scared that it's going to bring attention to me. I want to do X, but I am scared. Okay, so how do we walk a path of your authenticity that allows you to do these things and maintain your safety? Mm. 
so important and attention there, right? What is authentically me and what does it mean to be safe? Recognizing that those two things don't always coexist, right? Or that as I lean into my authenticity, some people will respond negatively in ways that can be harmful to me. Yes, and one of the things that I think about a lot when I think about authenticity and vulnerability is the way I speak at my mother's kitchen table is not the way I speak at the boardroom. And they're both me. Yes. In neither place am I showing up inauthentically. Right. I have different relationships with different people and they get to see different parts of who I am. Mm -hmm. So how can we incorporate that into wherever you're moving in the world so you can feel comfortable in your skin. You can feel, you can be you and understand that different situations might reward different ways of being in those moments. Yes, I believe that's so wonderful because we have layers and complexity and nuance. And if we're not careful, people can assume a different version of you means a false you or a fake you. And as you say, it's context and relationship. I often say to uh, my students, I teach at Pepperdine University, that if we saw you with a room full of your cousins, you probably would seem different than you are in this classroom, but it's still you. Yeah. 100%. And, it's, and I think it is possible to be inauthentic. Yeah. So it's not that it's not possible. It's just also possible for us in our complexity yeah. to be authentic and it look very different in different spaces. Mm -hmm. I don't want to bring all of myself into certain spaces. I want to be able to bring my thoughts my, and not bring everything else. In other spaces, I want to bring more of the jokes and the laughter and the let my yes. hair down proverbially. Yes. That's not what I want everywhere. Sometimes I'm here to take care of business and I don't want us to talk about all the other stuff. Mm. Now, does that mean you don't know the totality of who I am? One of the first things you'll know about me is I have a most amazing wife. But are we going to talk about the argument we had last night? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. <laughs> yes. Really not. Yes. And I think it is so important for us to know you can share parts of yourself and parts of your story without having to feel you have to give away all of you. And I love that it's really a, a place of empowerment, discernment and being selective because not everybody is uh, worthy of the whole story and not every time is right to give the full story. Yeah. And then what about for women? What do you notice in terms of women in leadership? You know, that tends to be complex in a different way because it depends on the other identifying factors. Yeah white women versus black women, straight women versus gay women, right? So it's a harder umbrella to put one thing on. I will say, and this is something that I've seen, and even when we look at kind of politics, there was a generation of women who believed they had to rep replicate the ways men did business to be successful. Mm -hmm. And we're now in a space where, it, it's in some arenas, maybe like in law, it's still quite normative in terms of how we show up, what we're wearing. But I have friends who are partners in law firms who have locks, right? So there's a, there's a different level of expression possible in many places for showing up that isn't quite so buttoned up. And in that, the bigger challenge then becomes about our niceness. Mm. So are we nice enough? Not are we qualified enough? Wow. There's a tension that folks have between being able to do the work and being a light. Mm -hmm. And for women, women in particular, being a light is way too important. Yes. We are rewarded for it. We're punished when folks are not. I mean, I could go into the politics of it, but if you just look at some of the presidential races. Yes. How are mm -hmm. how is it that folks won and folks lost? There's a different standard for likability when it comes to women, mm -hmm. which isn't fair. Right. Um, so we spend a lot of time talking about what it means, again, to be successful, to thrive, to show up as yourself, 
and to understand how to maneuver within various environments. Mm -hmm. Each individual will have their own personal challenges based on where they work, what they do, their own personality that will rub up against societal norms. Mm -hmm. But I have often found that tension to be a, such a big tension, in fact, that folks start to doubt their capability when what's happening is people are responding to them not being docile or not being easy to manipulate. Yes, yes. That when you are not easy to manipulate, you are uh, less likely to be liked, right? Because people like who they can control. And so being able to, that goes back to that tenacity and courage of being willing to move forward with the vision knowing that some people not only won't like you, but because they don't like what you're doing, also won't like, not only will they not like what you're doing, but also not like you, the person, because you represent the transformation. You mentioned uh, earlier about burnout, and I know there are people listening who are leaders, whether in their family, their community, their work setting. Uh, What are some recommendations or practices uh, to prevent burnout? You know, this question feels a little bit like, what do I do to be healthy? We know what there is to do. The question is, why aren't we doing it? Very good question. I can say, oh, take breaks, whether they're micro breaks between meetings, vacations, spending time in nature. Right. So I feel like we know the answers of what is there to do or, or what do we need to do, which is create time for restoration. Oftentimes, and I I think about this analogy, when we park the car in the garage, that's rest. The car is resting, Mm -hmm. but it has to go to the gas station to get it filled up. Often we do the rest part and stop. So we'll go to sleep, get eight hours of sleep. and wonder why we're still tired. Where's the filling up part? Yes. How much of us even know what it means to fill ourselves up? Like if I said, what is it that fills you up? A lot of folks struggle with that question. Why? Because we are not incentivized to think about what fills us up. We're incentivized for survival. How can we get paid? How can we pay bills? How can we, how can we, not how can we take care of ourselves? Mm. And I love on the podcast, we often offer a homework and I would love for those who, of you who are listening to think about creating your list, your refill list, your fill-in station of what are the things that fill you up. And if you're not sure, uh, to explore, right? To try different things and see what can refill you. Because this is a, a really critical piece, not just the rest, but the refill. I love that. So and, how and can people... Folks, yeah. Listen, for folks who are saying, okay, I get it, but I don't know where to start. I'll give you some of mine. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I appreciate they'll be different for different people. I love being in nature. So anytime I'm in the presence of the natural environment, not the built environment, but the natural environment, on a hike at a beach, I am in my sweet place. Mm -hmm. So I make an effort to go walking every morning in a park. When I am doing yoga, so I'm trained in yin yoga. In yin, you hold poses for five to 10 minutes. The ways that allows my body to exhale, I find deeply restorative and deeply rejuvenating. Mm. So those are examples of things that work for me. But taking the time to understand what works for you requires some self-awareness, requires that as you are moving through the world, you see what's energy draining and what's Mm -hmm. energy enhancing. Mm, Beautiful. And I love uh, the importance of us holding both questions, not only what to do, but our why, and not waiting until we're on empty to refill. So making that a part of our, our lifestyle, our ritual, And as you said, your daily practice, going, uh, walking in the morning. So what are things that we'll do before we get on empty? Well, I know that people will want to uh, connect with you. And so tell us how people can do that. Absolutely. You can reach me on LinkedIn. 
Patrice Ford Lynn, L-Y-N. You can also reach me on my email, which is patrice at catapultchange.com. Patrice at catapultchange.com. Wonderful. So we touched on the different parts of your uh, bio, but as we close, I want to ask you about, and this is a huge question, but I'll ask it briefly, how being a cancer survivor has affected your willingness to show up in life the way that you do? It was interesting to watch myself. You don't know who you are until you're in the moment of it. And thankfully, I have a wonderful reflective mirror in my wife to say, wow, you handled that extraordinarily well. I would create playlists anytime I'd go to chemo. I would have meditations I would listening, I would listen to and visualizations I would listen to while I was going through chemo. So there is so much that I did to keep my spirit intact, to keep my spirit whole, that I think it was an affirmation to me that my spirit, and, and this is something that we know unconsciously, but it, was, it became very conscious for me that protecting my spirit is my responsibility. So in the same way we said there's going to be resistance, there were people who wanted to talk to me all the time. I didn't have the energy for that because I needed to heal. Yes. So my ability to set boundaries, my ability to understand what was really working for me and what wasn't. If I needed music, if I needed laughter, if I needed quiet and give that to me has allowed me to come out the other edge unapologetic in my mm. doings. Ah, beautiful. Well, I am grateful that you are living unapologetically and a reminder for us of when we set those boundaries, it frees us up to heal so that we can do what we are really here to do. So thank you. And I want to tell our listeners, I invite your soul to tell your heart, mind, body, and spirit, welcome home. Mm -hmm.